Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. I pray that the Bible study will be of tremendous benefit to everyone. Lift you up. Make you have progress. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you because you brought us together so we can learn. We're asking, Lord, that what we reach, what we teach, what we learn, what we receive, will be a benefit to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray we'll not remain at the same point standing still. We'll move forward in knowledge, forward in understanding, forward in wisdom, and forward making progress in our spiritual lives in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole church said, We're coming to Mark chapter 12 tonight. And we're reading from verse 13 all through to verse 27. Those are the verses we're studying tonight. Let me just read a few of the verses to you. Mark chapter 12 reading from verse 13. And he sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Understand that? He sent those people to catch him, not to learn, not to profit, not to benefit. They had a bad purpose. Thank God we are not like that. Look at verse 14. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? They were asking, Is it all right? Is it lawful? Is it proper for us who are the children of Israel to pay tax to Caesar, a foreign king? Look at verse 15. Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, and that I may see. And they brought it. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They, say, they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. They were surprised at his answer. He marveled at his wisdom. In verse 18, then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, they asked a question. And as the Lord answered them, look at verse 24. And Jesus answering said unto them, do ye not therefore err go astray, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? And now he affirmed resurrection before them. Tonight our topic is the faithfulness and the future stage of kingdom citizens. Those who become citizens of the kingdom. They turn away from sin. They turn to the Savior. They have the assurance in their hearts. Their sins are forgiven. They are now citizens of the kingdom of God. They are faithfulness unto God. Rendering to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. And rendering to God the things that belong to God. That's their faithfulness. And then at the time of the resurrection that the Pharisees were asking about, their future stage. That is the future stage of the kingdom citizens. 
So tonight, we're looking at the study under the title, The Faithfulness and the Future State of Kingdom Citizens. Three things we're looking at as we study the passage tonight. Number one, the wickedness and insincerity of heartless tempters. They came to tempt the Lord. They were heartless. They were hardened. And they were not sincere. Point number one, the wickedness and the insincerity of heartless tempters. Point number two, the wisdom and insight of the heavenly teacher. This is Christ, the teacher that has come from heaven. Yes, we know his Savior. We know his Lord. We know his King of Kings is also teacher. The teacher that came from heaven. The wisdom and insight of the heavenly teacher. Point number three, the willfulness and ignorance of hardened transgressors. They asked a question. They had the ulterior motive. Apart from that, they were so ignorant of the word of God. And they brought that ignorance to the Lord in their questioning. The, will, the willfulness and the ignorance of hardened transgressors. We're coming to point number one. And I'm reading over again from verse 13 to verse 15. The wickedness and the insincerity of heartless tempters. See them, hear them, note what they are asking in verse 13. And they said unto him, certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians, to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, they called him Master, they called him Teacher, they called him Rabbi, we know that thou art true, and thou carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but thou teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give, or shall we not give? But he, knowing the hypocrisy, said unto them, why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. Already you understand why we say they had wickedness? Because they came to tempt. They came with flattery. And they came with insincerity. And in their temptation, they wanted to catch him so that they can accuse him. Look at what he has said. He has said something against Caesar. And through that, they'll then get him to the powers that be so they can eventually kill him. As we look at those three verses, we see number one, the perverseness of malicious men. The perverseness of malicious men. But number two, we we'll see the perfection of the master. He knew that this is what they were after. But what they said about him, teaching the truth of the word of God, not partial, not caring for any man, but telling the truth as they thought to be, that was true. Even though they used that attribute of him in a negative way, the perfection of the master. Number three, the perception. He knew. He knew their mind. He knew their thoughts. He knew their goal. He knew what they were after, the perception of the Messiah. Let's see from number one, the perverseness of malicious men. I'm reading from verse 13 again. And he said unto him, certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians, to catch him in his words. That's their perverseness. Revealed in their intention. You know, sometimes uh, we give opportunity for people to ask questions in our church. 
the reason we will give that opportunity is to clear up whatever may not be clear to the people who have heard the teaching of the word of God. But if somebody is like the Pharisees, if somebody is like the Herodians, they will stay somewhere behind and teach their disciples and teach their followers, go and ask this question. At the end, they come with flatter, they come with praise, but it's not sincere praise. They say, we know in this our church, this is good, that is good, and that is good. But we're asking now, should we do this? Should we not do this? Actually, some of those people who are not sincere, who are wicked, who are malicious, I don't want to trip the preacher or the one answer, answering the question, they have ulterior motive. They want to convince everybody that the person asking the question, see what he has answered, see what he has said. But thank God, Jesus knew their intention. Thank God, we will not be like that. I will not be like that. Say it for yourself, I will not be like that. Look at Luke chapter 20. Luke records the same thing because their malice was well known. In Luke chapter 20 verse 20, And they watched him and sent forth spies. You see, Luke makes it very clear. He goes beyond what Mark had said in his description. He said, These are spies which shall fain pretend themselves to be just men, that they might take hold of his words, that, they, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. That was their intention. And they weren't there to learn. They weren't there to, have, to know the way to heaven. They were not there to repent, and they were not there so that they could be saved. They wanted to catch him in his words. They wanted to hold uh, some of his words, and so they can use that to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. And they said, and they asked him, saying, Master, they called him a good name, and that's what he was. He was master. We know that thou say, well, we know that, that thou says uh, and teachest rightly. We know what to teach is right. Look at these people. You will think that they wanted to serve the Lord. They wanted to bend the knee to the king, but not really. And it says, uh, neither acceptest thou the person of any but teaches the way of God truly. You know anybody that confesses that and he still does not follow the way of the Lord and he knows it is true. Repentance, that's true. Salvation, that's true. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, that's true. Except righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You cannot be saved. You cannot get to the kingdom of heaven. He knows that. She knows that, and yet she uses that not to repent, but to test and to tempt. Such a person, of course, is not going to go to heaven. Now they ask their question after their flattery, and they said in verse 22, Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or not? You will be wondering, why should they ask such a question? Is it lawful? You see, Caesar was not an Israelite. They, the children of Israel, had disobeyed the Lord. Therefore, he sold them to the Roman government. And the Roman government put Caesar there as the leader, as the king. And they were seen were children of Abraham. Therefore, it is not right for a foreigner to rule over us. And there were pockets of rebellion in the nation that was saying, don't pay tax to him and don't pay tribute to him. If you pay tribute, you are accepting the rule of a foreigner. Others are saying, well, since the king over us at this time, we shall pay. And so they wanted to put Christ in a corner. If he said, that's all right, pay tribute directly. 
they will say he supports the oppression of the Romans over them. If he said, don't pay a tribute, they will report him to the powers that be, and they will say he's teaching rebellion and civil disobedience. That's why they thought they will catch him. They couldn't catch Jesus, and they will not catch you. I said they will not catch you. Any tempter that comes thinking it will make you fall is mistaken. By the wisdom of God in your life, you will stand in Jesus' name. Let's look at it now. Number two in that section, the perfection of the master. We're coming to Mark chapter 12. We're reading from verse 14. And they that work, and when they had come, they say unto him, Master, that's his title, we know that thou art true. That's his perfection. Even his enemies knew he was true and cares for no man. Even his enemies knew his perfection. You care for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, whether they are low or they are high. You love them the same, you approach them the same, you tell them the truth the same, but teach us the way of God in truth. We know you are not like the Pharisees. That's what they were saying. We know like you are not like the Sadducees. You teach the way of salvation and the way to please God and the way to have Christian experiences. You teach each in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Let's look at the perfection of the Lord. How they have formed each every time. Matthew chapter 22. We're reading from verse 16. Matthew 22. Reading from verse 16. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master. They called him Master, but not that they were willing to be his disciples. They were disciples of the Pharisees. They were disciples of the Herodians. And they had no mind of repenting, no mind of changing, no mind of following after the Lord. But they knew the perfection of the Master. Look at this Master. We know, now that somebody told us, we are not following what somebody suggests or supposes. We ourselves, we know that thou art true. Thou art true. If you know that he is true, if you know that he is approved of the Heavenly Father, why are you not following? Look at his perfection and teach us the way of God in truth. If you are true, you will teach the way of God in truth. If you are not teaching the way of God in truth, then you are not true. You are not faithful, but in the case of Jesus Christ, you can see his perfection. And neither carest thou for any man, a rich man, a poor man, a highly placed man, a lowly person, you act the same to them. You respect, you love, you accept everyone. And you open the truth and you reveal the truth to everyone in the same way. For thou regardest not the person of men. You are just saying he was not a partial person. Why? Because his life was a perfect life. And he only said what the Father had taught him. We're looking at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we're reading from verse 28. John 8, verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, the Christ. I am he, the Messiah. I am he, the Master. I am he the Savior, and I do, and that I do nothing of myself. That's his perfection. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak 
these things that's the quality of his life and if we are going to be moving towards a, a, the life of christ and the nature of christ have the mind of christ we will be like that also that we do nothing of ourselves we do everything by his grace we do everything in his love we do everything as the father as the lord as this word has taught us in verse 29 and he that sent me is with me he was conscious every time that god the father listening to every conversation and he listened to every answer he gave to every question and he listened to every message that he gave and he saw all the actions of his son if we have the same attitude and the same understanding that god is always present with us the father is with us and jesus the son is with us and the holy ghost is with us we'll be careful we'll be faithful as to what we say as to what we teach, as to what we preach, as to what we do. We must have the mind of Christ that knows that God is present every time, present with him. And you must have that mind is present with you. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always, always, always those things that please him what's the result of that look at verse 46 in verse 46 which of you convinces me of sin which of you can say you find sin transgression iniquity in the words of my mouth in the action of my hand and in the demonstration of my power which of you convinced me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? All these people that came will know you are master. And you teach the way of God in truth. Because you care for no man. And you are true and faithful. Why did they not believe in him? First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 21 first peter chapter 2 verse 21 for even here unto what ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we should follow his test look at the perfection of christ who did no sin at no time did he commit sin privately publicly or the pharisees or the sadducees among his disciples or when he was all alone on the mountainside praying he committed no sin he was the 40 days in the wilderness and satan tempted him and yet who did no sin that's perfection the perfection of the master neither was guile found in his mouth no guile no lying no deception no duplicity who when he was reviled he reviled not again and when he suffered he threatened not but he committed himself to him that judges righteously that's the perfection of the master come back to verse 21 for even here unto what ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we should follow his steps as we are saved and we have the grace of god and we have the spirit of god and we have the teaching of the word of god everything combined together will make us to follow the lifestyle of the lord jesus christ like master like disciple we're coming to first john chapter 3 First John chapter 3 verse 5 And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins And in him is no sin That's the perfection of our Savior The perfection of our Master The perfection of our Redeemer And he was manifested to take away our sin He had no sin 
he was spotless, he was blameless, he was sinless, and he wants to make us, every believer, like himself. That's why we read in verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Our master sinneth not. We followers who sin not. Our Savior sinneth not. And we who are saved by him will see not the one who has given us grace and the one who has gone to prepare a place for us in heaven. The very clear practical area of his life is that at no time did he commit sin. And now we who are following him and we abide in him, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him, little children. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Even as he is righteous. Always righteous in the public, in the private, when he alone, when he went with other people, when his disciples were there, when his disciples were not there, when he's with the women, when he's with the men, when he's in the crowd, when he's with only saints of God. And we are children of God as our master. Lived a righteous life, a perfect life, a godly life. He's saying that we too we must be righteous as he is righteous. Verse 8, he that committeth sin is not of Christ, is of the devil. He that committeth sin is not of God, is of the devil. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. The devil sinneth and keeps on sinning. The devil does, he follows a career of sinning. And he sins every time. No matter where the devil is, he cannot be righteous because his nature does not accept righteousness. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Somebody there shout amen. Hypocrisy is that of God of the devil. Lying is that of God of the devil. I was waiting for your answer. And the iniquity, transgression, is that of, the, of God of the devil. Of the devil. All the works of the devil, hypocrisy, pretense, flattery, sin, private sinning, habitual sinning, and the common sin, whatever sin, is the work of the devil. And Christ has come for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Why? Because Christ passes his nature. He passes his grace. He passes his strength unto such a person. And as Christ will not sin, you will not sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Because he is born of God. Let's come back to Mark chapter 12. We're looking at the third part of that point one, the perception of the master. The perception of the Messiah. Perception. Perception of the Messiah. We're looking at Mark chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 15. Mark chapter 12, verse 15. Shall we give or shall we not give? And he knowing their hypocrisy said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. This world is full of flatterers. And if you don't have the insight of Christ, you will not know when somebody flattering you to destroy you, 
flattering you to make you sell yourself into their hands, flattering you to get something out of you and to take the precious thing that you have. But they couldn't do that to Jesus. They will not do it to you. The perception of the Messiah. Let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. We're reading from verse 17. Matthew chapter 22. Reading from verse 17. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? What thinkest thou? Would like to know your thoughts. Would like to know your mind. Would like to know what you are thinking. You see, there are people that, and they are Christians, they are born again. But sometimes we who are born again, we're not always wise. People come, they flatter us, and they ask a question from us. What do you think about this? What do you feel about this? Should we go this direction? Should we go that direction? And there ain't somebody, he knows the Bible. He knows the chapter and the verse. And he knows everything. And without having the perception of the Messiah, he begins to open his mouth and then begins to say, you know, this and this and this. And then they want to tip him again and say, that's right, that's right. How about this? How about this? And he sells himself into the hands of the enemy. Your mouth will not sell you into the hands of the enemy. Your knowledge, good knowledge, will not sell you into the hands of your tempters in Jesus' name. You know, you know it's not compulsory you tell everybody everything in your mind what are you thinking about how what thinkest thou is it lawful to give tribute unto caesar or not we live in a political world and you know politics is everywhere in the papers on the radio television internet news everywhere and there are people they want to size you up they want to know where you stand so that they can take your word what do you think of this uh, present government what do you think of this uh, present arrangement and what do you think of this and that do you think that we as Christians, uncompromising Christians, Christians who are standing by the word of God, and Christians who are not of this world, and Christians who are for heaven, what do you think we should do? Should we do this or should we do that? Which party do you support? Which one do you not support? And the way they are lively and the way they are excited about the question, and they say, we know you are deep alive. We know you are a real child of God. We know you are going to tell the truth. If we don't have perception, you will sell yourself into the hands of the enemy. But God will give you wisdom. Nobody will trip you and nobody will tempt you and you will not lose your life into the hands of anyone in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. But Jesus perceived their wickedness. Perception. Perception. Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Let's look at chapter 20. Chapter 20 of Luke. In Luke chapter 20, I'm reading here from verse 23. Luke chapter 20, we're reading from verse 23. But he perceived their craftiness. Uh, you see the words that Matthew used, he perceived their wickedness. And Mark said he perceived their hypocrisy. And Luke is saying he perceived their craftiness. The wicked, the hypocritical, and their crafty. And said unto them, why tempt ye me? By the way, he gave them an answer. And everybody wondered that he gave them that answer. But do you know, when they were going to accuse him, do you know what they said? Now, 
the answer he gave them, he said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. But he still said what they wanted to see. Look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 2. Are you there? Luke chapter 23, what verse are you looking for? Verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Look at that. He gave them an answer. He said, give unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. He didn't forbid them to give tribute unto Caesar. And yet, they still laid the accusation. There's no point answering them. There's no point relating to them. There's no point interacting with them. What they want to say against you, no matter what your answer is, and no matter how wise you are, they are still going to say what they will say. You will not be a friend to an enemy who wants to destroy you. And they will not blindfold you to think, if I show them, if I reveal to them, they will understand, this is where I stand. They understood where Jesus stood, and they still said what they wanted to say. Let's come back now to point number, uh, before we go to that point, let's see Hebrews chapter 4. We're reading from verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4. We're reading from verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. They couldn't hide their intention from Christ. And nobody today can hide his intention, can hide his goal, can hide what he wants to do, his action from Christ. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Well, we are children of God. We're not even trying to hide anything from our God. Are you trying to hide from God? No, we're not trying to do that. And we cannot hide from God. He knows everything. Let's come back to Mark chapter 12. Now we come to point number two. The wisdom and insight of the heavenly teacher. The wisdom and the insight of the heavenly teacher. Let's understand that Jesus Christ is a teacher come from heaven. We are coming to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 2. John chapter 3, reading from verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, we know that thou art a teacher from God. Thou art a teacher from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. They all knew that, that he was from heaven. He was the heavenly teacher, and he had wisdom. God will give you wisdom. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 24. Jesus Christ, look at his description here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Come to Bastachi. But of him are ye in Christ, in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom 
and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. As we come to Mark chapter 12, reading from verse 15 to verse 17. Mark chapter 12, verses 15 to 17. Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. You see, why did he say, Bring me a penny? Let me see the image on that penny. Let me see the image, the superscription there. If you will remember, when we are using coins, on one side, they write on the coin the value of the coin. On the other side, they'll have the picture of the king, or the picture of the queen, or the picture of anyone that is having authority over that country. If that country does not accept the authority of that king, of that queen, they will not use a coin. They will say it has the image of somebody we don't accept. But once that country accepts to use that coin, it means they accept the authority of the one whose image and superscription is on that coin. And the children of Israel were using the coin that had Caesar's image at the back of it. And instead of Jesus bringing out a coin by himself, he said, do you spend coins? And do you spend the money that has uh, any image on it? Oh, they said, of course, yes, we trade, we do marketing. He says, can you show me a penny there? And then they brought out a penny. He said, now tell me, whose image is this, this picture here? Whose superscription is this on this coin? They said, Caesar's. Aha, uh -huh, you, you accept the ruling and the leadership and the royalty of Caesar. Since you are spending the money that has his image, give back unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But that's not the end of your life. You are not all physical. You have a spirit. You have a soul. And your spirit was created by God. And your soul was created by God. Give unto God what belongs to God. That's wisdom. God will give you wisdom. God will give me wisdom. In this life, living one day at a time. All the barrage of questions will not come in one day, only one question at a time. Living one day at a time, the wisdom you need to walk step by step, day after day, that you will always be victorious, the Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. This part has two sections. Number one, our duty towards Caesar and the government. Number one, part one, our duty towards Caesar and the government. Point number two, part two, our devotion towards the Creator, our God. Our devotion towards the Creator, our God. Let's look at number one, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's our duty towards Caesar and the government in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. We're reading from verses 6 and 7. Romans chapter 13, verses 6 and 7. For, for this cause, pay ye tribute also. Paul the apostle was writing to believers. And these believers were even being, uh, you know, um, 
persecuted by the Romans. And yet, he said, you're Christians, you're born again, you're a child of God, as our master, our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior did, we also follow the same. For for this cause, pay ye tribute also, you pay your tax, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. I didn't know that, that those government officials are God's ministers. In what way are God's ministers? They are God's ministers in the sense that God created the world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he has appointed them to take care of the roads, of the bridges, of the street lights, of uh, a lot of amenities, of education, of uh, medical, medical things, so that they can take care of God's earth, but that needs money. And those uh, governors or presidents or kings, they are not going to, they don't have enough money by themselves to repair the roads and to do everything. In, uh, and if they're going to minister and develop the world the way it ought to be to serve us as children, we have to pay our taxes. In verse uh, 7, render therefore to all their due, any king, uh, any president, any governor, any local chief, any head of a, of a council, it says we should render therefore to all their due, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear, that means respect, honor to whom honor. I pray God will keep us faithful in Jesus' name. Church, say good amen now. We're coming to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We children of God are law-abiding citizens. You will be a law-abiding citizen in Jesus' name. You will not break the laws of the land, the good laws of the land. Titus chapter 3 verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject unto principalities and powers, unto uh, the principals, uh, the presidents, the kings, and to magistrates, to obey magistrates, and to be ready to every good work. Ready to every good work. Look at First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. We're reading from verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're reading from verse 13. In verse 13, it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. You're not obeying because you're afraid. You're not obeying just because the law might be after you to punish you, but for the Lord's sake. Because Jesus is your Lord, and because you are born again, that's why you obey the laws of the land that are to keep the land in peace, progress, and prosperity. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, number one in the country, or unto governors of the various states, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well doing, not with rioting, not with carrying placards. What not with protest, but with well doing, ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your freedom, your liberty, for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. We will in Jesus' name. I will. You will, a whole church will, in Jesus' name. 
part one there, our duty towards Caesar and the government. Part two, our devotion towards the Creator, our God. We're coming back to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We're reading from verse 17. Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, the things that belong to Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. Render unto God the things that belong to God. God requires that we recognize Him as a creator. And those of us who are saved is both our creator and our redeemer. And he wants us to check up what we offer unto him. Is he good enough? Look at Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. Malachi chapter 1. Reading from verse 6. His son honoreth his father. And his servant is master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? This is the question the Lord was asking the children of Israel. Don't you know, everybody ought to know, his son honors the father, his servant honors the master. I am your father, I am your creator, I am your maker. Where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts unto you. O priest that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Look at verse 7. Ye offer polluted bread upon my altar. You will say, I've offered to the Lord. I've offered to the Lord. But look at what you offer. It's polluted. It's not edible. It's not proper. It's gone stale. It's gone rotten. You offer polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted, have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. They said, after all, we're offering it to the Lord. It doesn't have to be pure. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be clean. After all, God is not going to eat it and He's not going to make use of it directly. They don't spend our, you know, country coin in heaven. And so whatever we give Him, they don't spend our currency in heaven. God does not really need it. Therefore, we just throw something to Him which is not clean, which is not proper, which is not good enough. Look at verse 8 And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice Is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick Is it not evil? Listen to this now Offer it now unto thy governor Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person Says the Lord of hosts is saying, you grudge me in giving me the offering of your treasure, in giving me the offering of your time. And you are not patient with me, you are not perfect with me, and you are not giving me all that I deserve. And if you question why are you saying that God, is that not enough, offer that to your governor. Will he accept that from you? Offer that to Caesar. Will he accept that from you? If your governor, if Caesar will not accept that from you, why are you offering that to God? Offer something good, your heart, your soul, your mind, your very life. Everything belongs to God. Offer it back to God. Your strength and your knowledge and everything you have which is good offer it back to the lord we're looking at romans chapter 6 romans chapter 6 we're reading from verse 13 romans chapter 6 verse 13 neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin but yield yourselves unto god 
as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's what to offer to God and that's how to offer unto the Lord. Look at chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Here it tells us, I beseech you therefore, therefore because God has paid the utmost sacrifice for you and has paid the utmost price for your salvation, for you to become a kingdom citizen. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. How do I present my body unto God? It's not talking of flesh and blood. It's talking about your brain in your body, your knowledge in your body, your intelligence in your body, your expertise in your body, and the know-how and the good, good things you can do with your body. Present it to God for His service, a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, will present the very best unto God in Jesus' name. The best of your ability, the best of your skill, and the best of your talent will present to God so that people will know God and they'll be saved through you in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? What do you think? Somebody has a house. He is the landlord, and then you debar him, you hinder him from using any part of that house. And you take ownership of it as if the thing is totally yours. You will not pay house rent, you will not pay your due, you will not even respect that landlord, and you will not give him any chance to have any inroad or any habitation in that place. That's what people do. He has created you, and he has recreated you and saved you. And there are people that do not allow God to have any say in their lives. They will not allow God to have any input into how they live and how they make use of their body. And yet, it's the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's what he's saying. Offer yourself back to God. Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Ye are bought with a price. What do you think? You have gone to buy a car. And as you bought the car, you paid the whole price for that. And yet the dealer will not release that car to you. And you see him driving the car about and doing everything he wants to do. And you say, ah, dealer, what's happening? I paid all the money and this is the receipt. And you will not even allow me to have access to the use of the car. You say, this is not right. And the whole world will agree with you that is not right. The same thing with you. The Lord has purchased you. And the Lord has bought you with a great price. And yet, it cannot get your attention. You've been in the church for five years, ten years, twenty years. You'll not be a worker. And you will not give him the service that is due unto him. You know how to work. And you know how to do right. You do well in the world, in the business world, in the professional world. And yet, you will not give of that which God has purchased. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, which are God's, you glorify God. I will glorify God. We will all glorify God with our body, our brain, our mind, our intellect, our skill, everything with God in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. 
we'll come to point number three now. The willfulness and ignorance of hardened transgressors. The willfulness and the ignorance of hardened transgressors. We're coming to Mark chapter 12. I read from verse 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, they always say, Master, and you'll think they're going to agree with him, Master. You'll think they will listen and they will follow everything he said, Master. Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother, if a man's brother died, and leave his wife behind, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up siege unto his brother. Now, there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her, and died, and neither left any seed. And the third likewise, and the seven at her, and left no seed. And last of all, the woman died also in the resurrection. What they were saying is, they didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't accept there was going to be any resurrection. And they wanted to tell Jesus a story. We don't know about this story, whether the story is true or not. But they said, well, we'll catch him with this. You see, all the questions they were asking, they can make up a story. And they can cook up a story. And then from that story, they will want the public to know that his doctrine is not right. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So they said, one man got married, and this wife did not have any child. His brother took him, took her, and then the brother, another brother, until seven of them. I doubt the story that men will keep on going for the same woman, the same woman, seven of them. Well, in the resurrection, who is going to be the husband of that woman at the time of resurrection? What they were saying is, there can be no resurrection. Because if there is a resurrection, there will be confusion. The first man will say, that's my wife. The second one will say, no, cannot be your wife. It's going to be my wife. Are the seven of them going to marry the woman when they get on the other side? So they said in verse 23, in the resurrection. Therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven at her to wife. That's part one of their story. Part one of their story is the Sadducees' reasoning. The Sadducees' reasoning. Why did they reason like that? Because they had made up their minds. They were not going to believe resurrection. And so they wanted a story that will prove that they were right. There is no resurrection. The Sadducees' reasoning. Come to my, uh, Acts of the Apostle chapter 4. Acts of the Apostle chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. And as they speak unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You see, the answer did not change them. That's the picture of the people who are answering questions. And because they still kept their reasoning, they were Sadducees, Christ had even risen from the dead. And after the resurrection of Jesus, they still will not believe resurrection. Look at chapter 20, 23. In Acts chapter 23, we're reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 23, verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. They are still saying that. After Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. 
and he appeared with many infallible proofs to show that he had risen from the dead. The Pharisees still maintained what were believed is what we have always believed. He gave us an answer, but we don't accept. We still believe there is no resurrection. And the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. Neither angel, they say there is no angel, there is no resurrection, no spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. The, the Sadducees reasoning, let's come back to Mark chapter 12 verse 25, the Savior's revelation, the Savior's revelation. In Mark chapter 12, reading from verse 25. For when they shall rise from the dead, let me back up to verse 24. Jesus answering said unto them, Ye do, do not ye err therefore, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. That's what he didn't understand. That after the resurrection, there's no marriage after resurrection, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And, and as touching the dead, that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. The Lord reveals there is resurrection. I believe in the resurrection. I said I believe in the resurrection. These people, were they not reading even their Old Testament? Look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. That's why Jesus said, you err, you go astray, because you do not know the scriptures, and you do not know the power of God. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, that's resurrection, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's resurrection. If you come to Job, you also see that the people in the Old Testament were not ignorant of the resurrection that will take place. Job chapter 19, reading from verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin warms, destroy this body, that means after he died, yet in my flesh shall I see God as resurrection. Whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, shall behold, and not another, though my rays be consumed within me. If they had read their scriptures, they would have understood there is resurrection. Resurrection. John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we're reading from verse 28, John chapter 5, verse 28. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Resurrection is the revelation of the word of God. There is resurrection. Number one, the Sadducees reasoning. Number two, the Savior's revelation. Number three, the saints' realization. 
the saints realization the saints realization we're coming to mark chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 25 mark chapter 12 verse 25 for when they shall rise from the dead they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels which are in heaven the lord is telling us here that marriage is only for this world and it's necessary in the world to have companionship it's necessary in the world that we keep our purity to avoid fornication let every man have his wife and let every woman have her husband marriage is good and honorable in the world but after we finish here our journey and we go to the other side in the resurrection there is no marriage you see there are people that miss heaven because of marriage i want to marry i want to marry it's good to marry but don't allow marriage which will not be after the resurrection don't allow that to hinder your life here on earth and your righteousness here on earth when we get over there on the other side we will be like the angels in heaven you will be like the angels in heaven if you are married, encourage one another to remain with the Lord and to abide with the Lord. If you are not married yet, the Lord will give you a good wife, a good husband that will not hinder your getting to heaven in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. We're looking at verse 34. Luke chapter 20, verse 34. It says, And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage in this world, in this world, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, the one to come, and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given a marriage on the other side when we get to heaven neither can they die anymore you know those uh, Pharisees were saying this one married her he died that one married her he died that one married her he, he died there will be no death on that other side and there will be no suffering for those who get to heaven for they are equal unto the angels i'm watching for that time when i'll be like the angels are you waiting for that time it will happen in jesus name and they are the children of god being the children of resurrection the children of resurrection i pray when the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall rise incorruptible that you will rise with them in jesus name and when the rapture shall take place and then we shall go with the people of god your seat and your place will not be missing in jesus name marriage will not hinder you i said marriage will not hinder you your marriage will help you you're a christian you're a believer and then you're married to somebody who is also a believer your marriage will help each other to be with the lord on that final day in jesus name first thessalonians chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 13 but i would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope for if we believe that jesus died and rose again jesus died and rose again i believe in the resurrection even so them also which sleep in jesus will god bring with him for this will say unto you by the word of the lord that we which are alive and remain and shall not and unto the coming of the lord shall not prevent them which are asleep for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with the with the with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first is there resurrection do you believe in resurrection and the dead in christ shall rise first 
then we which are alive and remain unto the come and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and so to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and so shall you ever be with the Lord and so shall I ever be with the Lord whatever you are going through now you know problem here problem there persecution there persecution there it will soon be over I said it will soon be over even before that time, as you pray and you say, Lord, look at what I'm going through, whatever temptation, whatever trial, that will be more than the grace you have, the Lord will not allow it to come your way. And as we have announced 2020 vision and 2020 recovery for this coming retreat, which something is coming your way. All those tears the Lord will wipe away. 2020 recovery, 2020 restoration, 2020 revival, 2020 power in your life. We will be with the Lord eventually. We have for comfort one another with these words. Everything will soon be bright in your life. This resurrection, even now spiritually, he revives us and he raises us up. The spiritual resurrection, even today, the hand of the Lord can touch you. I said the Lord, hand of the Lord can touch you. And that recovery, 2020 recovery, 2020 revival, will start even tonight in your life in Jesus' name. Where are you? Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I believe, I believe, I believe. You're still on the throne and I'm going to have everything you have prepared for me. He will open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. He will do it in your life.